refreshment, but also there's a after church about 11 o'clock on wisdom and the application of the Word of God to our lives so that we can grow together in these summer months. We'll have about six sessions or so, so we can have an, an informal, rather informal discussion and share our thoughts from the Word of God and grow together. We're so glad that we have been given the wisdom of God, who is Jesus Christ. Hear now this call and this celebration that the psalmist makes in Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah God. He's made the heavens and the earth and has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. Receive God's blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 234, which is a versification of the psalm which was our call to worship this morning. 234, the glorious gates of righteousness. And note the, the fourth stanza that we'll sing. In this the day the Lord has made, triumphantly we sing. Note that, triumphantly we sing. Send now prosperity, O Lord, O Lord, salvation bring. For the first four stanzas, 234. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The law of God. Ten Commandments recorded for us in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. The God who spoke to Israel speaks to us today. And just a comment upon the reading of the law, perhaps for those who are not used to hearing the law of God read in a gospel church. Well, we read the law of God because it's the moral law of God that applies to every people and every time. And here is Revelation Revelation of God, revelation of the God of our salvation and the holiness of God, for example, is just uh, um, shining in every single commandment. God claims us as his own. I am the Lord, your God. That's why you obey me. All these things show us the the God of our, our great salvation as well. Now, Jesus himself reminded us of the universal and Uh, important application of the law of God when he was asked one day, Master, what's the Old Testament all about? That's really what he was saying. What is the Word of God all about revealed for us? How are we to respond to it? What's the great commandment? Well, Jesus, glad to oblige him, as always he was, to show the will of God. And he said, here's what it's all about. You, who know the law of God, you especially who've been covenanted with, I am the Lord your God, you are my people. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, everything that's within you. That's the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it, of your neighbor as yourself. Show that you love God by loving that maybe unlovable person right next to you or down the road. May the Lord bless us with this revelation, this light that's shining now in our service because he's spoken, this light too that is our peace. For Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the law, and in him we are redeemed from the curse of those who would keep the law but who cannot. So let's read or let's sing in response to the law of God. The reading of it in the light of the gospel, number two in the Psalter hymnal, which is entitled in our Psalter hymnal, Blessed is he who loves God's precepts. Versification of Psalm 1, we and our children, let's sing the five stanzas of number two.
gather together in the house of God this morning, and it's called in the Word of God, the house of prayer. That's what we're going to do presently, but we come in the name of Jesus, remember, so very importantly, we come in the name of Jesus, calling upon that name for all our righteousness and the forgiveness of sins that is in him. Sinners, how we need the Savior. Sinners, how glad we are as we trust in him. His righteousness covers the multitude of sins. He is our perfect Redeemer. Let's go to God now. Let's fly to God in the name of Jesus and the wings of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thanks with all our hearts we give to thee, for you have shown all of your heart to us in sending your Son and giving us to be a people which is a people blessed indeed, blessed indeed of all peoples of the earth, for you have loved us and shown your love by redeeming us, purchasing us from sin and from sin's guilt and bondage. You have given us naturally sons of Adam without hope. You have given us hope. You have given us forlorn creatures, us wandering ones, us cursed ones, the blessing from heaven which we in society so desperately need. You bless us, Lord, in gathering us here together in the house of God, the wonderful place to be. You're everywhere, Lord, and everywhere we are blessed. But you have stated that you love it when we assemble together. And you've promised us that where two or three or more, even a multitude are gathered together in the name of your Son, you will honor that gathering with your special presence, your spirit, your grace, your truth, working mightily to save and to build up your chosen ones. We are humble. Lord, so humble. Because as we think of the great blessings we have, we think that we are so undeserving. And this is a proper thought, to be sure. We think in the light of the Word, not in the light of our own thoughts themselves, but in the light of the testimony, the truth of heaven. And we look in that Word, and it is the Word of revelation of God, the Holy God, who demands perfection. We ourselves are far from that. In fact, there's none righteous, no, not one in all of the earth by nature, by birth. And we are among those as well who, though we be born again, though we are Christian and have this beginning of the new life, yet there is this tendency toward the unrighteousness of the flesh. And we followed that this past week, Lord. We're sorry. We confess our faults, our sins, and that we've not let go of the besetting sins, that it's hindered our running the race set before us. The sins of the flesh, the greed, the worldliness, the practical skepticism, whereby we hold to a true confession and yet don't hold it so carefully and personally as we ought, the idolatry of yielding to forces and inclinations rather than to God, the hatred shown in our whipping and stabbing and hurling things at people with our tongues. These are the sins and a thousand others we've committed. Sins, Lord, that remain. Oh, for them we are so sorry. God Almighty, we pray, rid us of sin. We're not going to say, just rid us of some sin. Rid us of all sin, Lord. Without worthy. 
worthy, that we walk rightly and uprightly. And you call us to be perfect as you are, and children of you, our Father. And not to take your name in vain, the name that's been on our heads since baptism, the name that we confess when we walk and we come to church, the name Jesus. And we're sorry, Lord. We've treated it so lightly that we've been set aside, and children and young people and adults have been set aside by your grace, taken aside, called out of the world. We treat it so lightly. We treat it as if salvation is just another thing, another good thing of the earth, and as if it were not of heaven. And we think we've arrived. We're so smug. We think we've arrived. We declare things that you have done, Lord. You have made us to be your temple. We are the temple of the Lord. That's a fact, and we declare it. We shout it from the rooftops and the mountaintops and even in the valley of the shadow of death. You are our God, and you've made us to be your holy place. And yet, smugly and proudly and complacently, we're like those Pharisees of old. We are the temple of the Lord, and no one else is. We're rather proud of that. Father, forgive us. All our slothfulness, our smugness, our worldliness, our perversity, our pride, our prejudice, all the sins of worldlings that ought not to be among any of the sons of men, certainly not among the sons of God. In our positions as husbands and wives, we've been careless. We've been flippant about our responsibility. We've been not full of the joy we ought to be. But the one you have given, as parents, we've been negligent, impatient, abrupt, not caring. As children, we've been unresponsive to the the gospel that's been presented in our homes and in the church, and, and we just want to see for ourselves what's true and not just to believe sight unseen, not having played the religious field. God, all of this in our positions as our persons and office bearers too in the church and workers and with our free time, we've been those like the world. Oh, God in heaven, we pray, pardon us now with a pardon that's in Jesus. Because, Lord, you have pledged yourself to be faithful to your word and you've said that as we come and confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us, faithful and just to forgive us because the cross is our plea. And there, mercy and justice, they met and there was no clash but a perfect harmony. We beheld the wounds and we've melted away and there's the beginning of God with us and in us. And we confess, Lord, as we will hear presently in the sermon, You are our God, our Lord, and our God. We pray, bless each and every one here with true faith. Call out of darkness those who may yet be in darkness in the congregation, those who may be visiting, hearing on the radio, listening on the Internet. God in heaven, may your great congregation chosen before the foundation of the world be gathered and defended and preserved this day. This is the day, Lord, you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hear our prayers. Bless us in all our needs, Lord. Bless us so that we can be faithful. And as we face even the hardest of trials, even death itself for us or our loved ones, as some in the church gathered here today, even do now. God, give us faith and give our dying loved ones faith to trust in Jesus and in Him alone. And bless us, Lord. Bring us back. 
with your bringing back blessing. Build us up. Encourage us in wisdom's happy and holy, full of hope way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Your offering for the preaching of the gospel will now be received. Number three, wherefore do the nations rage? Here is one of the Psalms in which the divinity of Jesus Christ is clearly evinced and revealed to us in the Psalm which speaks of Jehovah and his Son and calls all nations, kings included, and all those who would be so proud in themselves to kiss the Son. That worship that's due to the Father is due to the Son. For, as Jesus says, he and his Father are one. Four stanzas, number three.
Let's take our Bibles at this time and read from John chapter 20. And we're going to pick up the narrative here of Jesus' appearance to his disciples, especially on two days, the day he was risen and then the week later. At verse 19, John 20 and verse 19, Mary Magdalene has come and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, who was risen, of course, and that he had spoken things to her uh, of himself and where he was going. He's ascending to his Father's right hand. In verse 19, that same day, then that same day, that Sunday, that resurrection Sunday at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, you'll note here there's three times that Jesus is going to say peace to you. And children, see if you can follow along there and follow the three times that Jesus says peace to you. So peace be with you, he says. And verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, or we could translate this, but Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came that first Sunday. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, which we should know according to the Hebrew reckoning of time was next week, next Sunday, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, went right through the doors, and stood in the midst and said again, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving. We could translate that, don't be an unbeliever. But be believing, be a believer. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. Thus far we read the sacred word, this thrilling account of this meeting of Jesus with his disciples and then the disciples with Thomas. And I dare say, beloved, that Jesus has just met with us in the reading of his word. May he continue to be with us as we hear now what your servant would say, as I humbly would bring to you that wonderful confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God, verse 28. Thomas answered, said to Jesus, my Lord, my God. This is truly an outstanding confession on all counts, not the least of which it's the only confession of a disciple recorded in the Gospels where the disciples said of Jesus that he was his Lord and his God. Imagine that, the doubting Thomas faith 
so worked that when Jesus speaks to him and tells him to do certain things and rebukes him for being unbelieving and calls him to be believing, all Thomas can do, the only thing he can do is that which is becoming. He says, my Lord, my God. Thomas converted to true Christianity. And true Christianity, let's be real here, has ever confessed really the same thing. Basically, when the church has followed, and since it has followed Thomas in his confession of Jesus' lordship and of his being God, the church has also followed this in her creeds, in her controversies, and in her contending for the faith of the fathers living still and the faith of Thomas and the faith of the early church. The Christian church declares... And we declare from this pulpit, Jesus Christ is Lord and God, meaning to say, He is co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and as such, He is the Savior of the church, the God our Savior who is revealed among men, revealed in this word, preached in this pulpit, and out of that faith the church lives. That's been the confession of the church, not without controversy, but the mainline Christian church has stood the ground on this, at least according to her confessions, the ecumenical ones written in the first centuries A.D. Even these creeds hammered out on the anvil of controversy with regard to the identity of Jesus. You see, there were people denying that Jesus is God, maybe saying he's like God, or he has God in him in a remarkable way, but they were saying, no, he's not co-equal with the Father. Well, the church came to the conclusion readily, but not without controversy, that we must follow simply what God says and what Thomas says. For again, this is a Christological confession here, something that's said by a mere erstwhile doubting man of the identity of Jesus. When Jesus met with him that week after he was risen, something had to be impressed upon Thomas and the rest of the disciples, and something would come out of that poor doubter's mouth. Jesus is the Lord, and Jesus is God, and Jesus is my Lord, and Jesus is my God. The church, irresistibly, really, has followed the lead of the Holy Spirit's inspiring this confession and this word. And she has stood strong and been blessed. Even as Jesus says, as he inspired John to write, these things are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and have this blessing, believing, verse 31, you may have life in his name. And so the church's confession has been for life, in that name, life in the light of the truth and living out of that life and witnessing in all of the world and all of history of the God who's among us in Jesus and who is our only hope and salvation. But now, there's something here that we want to address in our day and as we sit in this pew and as we think about all kinds of things we might be doing later and as we then engage in all kinds of things apart from the public worship of the church. And that's this. We need to consider if this confession is really alive today. If the words of Thomas are really words that we live by, words that we make, we need to consider at the same time if the confession is so dead among us and so such a dead letter among us, even though it's true, Jesus is God and Jesus is Savior, we need to consider if the world has gotten into us and as if we've, wondering we should, if we've really become practical skeptics and materialists. Those are people who doubt unless they see. Those are people who live so in the world that they're not really concerned except maybe to look good about the things above. Now I wonder 
if the church for all of her orthodoxy has really so taken it for granted this truth that's been established for history long since since the fathers were led into the truth that for all intensive purposes we're just like Thomas pre one week after the resurrection Thomas in doubt Thomas just like the worldlings Thomas fed up with his whole things of following Jesus to the death of the cross, and there's nothing to come of it. Thomas with a dead Jesus, after all, who has no hope that he would rise and no belief that he is God, the Savior. So in that light, to regain this blessing, for a rebuke, I dare say, For all of us to one degree, for some of us to great degree, let's hear this. Let's all hear this. Thomas' confession, my Lord and my God. First of all, that objective, orthodox, biblical confession, Jesus is the Lord and Jesus is the God. Secondly, the personal aspect. We able to say, my Lord, my God? Finally, and something that's brought out here in a wonderful way, we say this together. Thomas had to be together with those disciples, brought back together with them, and when he was together with them, Jesus met with them together. That's why we meet together, so we can bolster our faith and know the blessing of eternal life through faith in Jesus' name. So my Lord and my God, first of all, the church's confession of this This wonderful truth that Thomas says here cannot be denied. Jesus is the Lord, Jehovah God. Jesus is God, God Almighty, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, as we shall see by and by in the sermons on the Orthodox Christian faith. Jesus is God. If you look at all of the creeds early on of the church, Uh, Aside from those that have gone astray, which are no longer Christian creeds, there's this fundamental truth that's confessed. This one, born of a virgin, born of Mary, who walked among men, who is truly man, is at the same time God. That's what we say here. He's our God. He is the God. There is no other God besides that God who is revealed in Jesus. You see, lots of people, they believe in God, a God. Even some great sects believe in one God, the monotheists. Very few truly believe that God is God revealed in Jesus Christ. You see, that's the difference between Christianity and all of the religions, besides the fact that Christianity is the religion that teaches grace, it's the religion that teaches God with us in Jesus, and great is the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. He's God. The theologians have different ways of, of teaching the congregants. Parents, take heed to this. You're all theologians and ought to be as you teach your children theology, different ways of showing how the Bible itself teaches that Jesus is God. One of them is to cite the various names that are given to Jesus, which obviously are God's names. And to share a name like God is to share divinity. That's what the Bible teaches. So, for example, when Isaiah the prophet is speaking of the son who would be born, the child who would be given, the son would be given, whatever, He says at the next verse in Isaiah 9, 6, this son who is born, this child who is given is called Wonderful. His name, one name, shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father or Father of Eternity, the Counselor, the Prince of Peace, all of these things. That's saying that Jesus is God. And so, The name Emmanuel is impressed upon those who are uh, uh, receiving revelations at the birth of Jesus. He shall be called Emmanuel, God with us, Emmanuel in the Hebrew, with us God. This Jesus, this little babe, 
This little babe. And that's why a Simeon and an Anna, they rejoice because when Jesus is born and it's evident to them that this is the Messiah, they are beholding God with them. And Joseph and, they, and Mary, they, they are just beside themselves. Don't you think you would be too if your son's name was Emmanuel? If God was walking in your midst and cooing and being other things that babies are and doing other things that babies do, and yet to be constantly reminded that this is God, how would you dare touch him, I say? That's an aside. There's a wonder to it all. His name is God. So John says, 1 John 5, 20, this is the true God and eternal life. Speaking of Jesus, this is the true God and eternal life. So you have names, and there, there's many other ways that the names of Jesus and the names of God coincide. They're given to each other. They share a name, which in the Bible means they share an identity. But then we move on, and again, this is not an exhaustive lesson and, and apology for the defense of the faith about the divinity of Christ. There, uh, I, I'm so glad to know that you are grounded in this already. But then the, the theologians go on to speak of the different attributes that Jesus uh, are, that are ascribed to Jesus as those attributes which only God himself has, like eternity. So when Micah in 5 verse 2 speaks of the one who would be coming out of Bethlehem, it reminds us that his goings forth have been of old, forever. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. So the one born in Bethlehem is one who is not born as a mere creature, but he's one who is begotten before the world's were. His goings forth have been of old. And then he comes in time in another special begotten sort of way, even taking on the flesh of a human being for our salvation. Eternity is ascribed to him in Revelation. In that marvelous glimpse of the exalted Messiah that John has in Revelation 1, he said to be the I am that I am, the first, the last, the one who is and who was and is to come. This is saying he is the one who is forever, without any beginning, Hebrews says, of him who is typified in Melchizedek. The ancient of days has no father, no mother on this earth, really. God is his father. He has no beginning, no ending. He's the eternal God. So eternity, omniscience, is something as well that Thomas would have recognized in the context of John 20. Because when Jesus, uh, when Thomas speaks to the disciples privately and says, I'm not going to believe him unless I see him and feel him. Jesus shouldn't have known about this, but he did. So when Jesus comes and appears physically to Thomas, he knows prior to this, because he's God, what Thomas has said and what is in Thomas's heart. He knows. This must have astounded Thomas, because the first thing Jesus does to him is rebuke him and call him to touch and call him to see if this is going to work faith and so on. So Thomas shrivels at this one who knows his heart, and I dare say we ought to be more shriveling sometimes. We act as if God doesn't know what we're thinking right now, as if God doesn't see everything. Jesus is God's eyes. He's looking. He's listening. He knows. He's omniscient. This is God. And this would be the marvelous attribute of God, which is shown in different other ways as well. Move on to power. Omni, omnipotence is, is what Jesus has, and that's what he shows in his miracles. And you might say, well, hold it a second, Reverend. It's not really a strong proof for the divinity of Christ to say he's omnipotent, and that's seen in his doing miracles. Why? Because others do miracles. Disciples do miracles. Those disciples, Thomas himself, we, we don't have a clue that he didn't, did miracles. Judas, apparently. The devil sometimes does miracles. He's given that power of God. But this is the difference. When Jesus does power, power and does miracles as God, 
He is one from whom the power flows. He's not one who's a mere instrument. He's the source of the almighty power, being God himself. One of his miracles, in fact, isn't it said, when I think the woman touched the hem of his garment, Jesus said, something flowed from me. You see, he has this power in himself as God. And it's not to be doubted that he would have such a thing because the work of creation is ascribed to him. John, in fact, in John chapter 1, and John is all about declaring the, the, the divinity of Christ, says that Jesus in the beginning was the Word, and the word, word was with God, and the Word was God, another name. And then it says that Jesus is the one by whom everything was created, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's Jesus' creation. And throughout the New Testament, there are references to the fact that Jesus is the creator with God, in the beginning, eternally, with the Father, creating the worlds, providing too, Hebrews tells us, providing by the word of God's power, all things are upheld, Hebrews 1, verse 3. But then, how about this work of God, like the creation of the church? Hebrews 3 reminds us that Jesus does this too as God. In Hebrews 3, Jesus is compared and contrasted to one such as Moses. And Moses himself is one who is only a servant in the house of God. And verse 3, this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. He's talking about Jesus, Hebrews 3, verse 3. Inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone but this. He who built all things is God. The implication there is that Jesus, who builds the church, not Moses, is God. And that's shown in that he builds the house, uh, builds the house which is the church. Moses, indeed, was a faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope from the end. I need not bring forth for you that the Bible teaches everywhere that Jesus is the creator of the church because he's the Savior. Salvation throughout the Bible is ascribed to God alone through his Son, but God revealed as his Son working this great salvation. And finally, theologians not only cite the names and the attributes and the the works of Jesus as coinciding with the Father's works, but they also say this. There's something very important to notice. The Bible says that worship should be given to God alone, not to Mary, not to angels, not to persons who are earthly creatures, but to God alone. Worship me, all ends of the earth, the prophet says. Well, we read in the Bible that worship is to be given also to Jesus, meaning, of course, that Jesus is God. Revelation 5, verse 12. The angels and the elders say in heaven, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing And then verse 13, blessing and honor honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, the Father, and to the Lamb forever and ever. There's God. Now let's remember Isaiah. And God speaking Isaiah, my glory I will not share with another. Here, John is given to see this vision of shared glory of God and the Lamb, meaning... That Jesus Christ is not another. He's God. One with God. So you have a very important passage here. But I refer also to John 10. And here's where some controversy is about. And then I'm going to slide into my second point here. John 10. And you can look at that with me if you like. It's a very important passage where Jesus says, I and my Father are one. In John 10 and verse 30. Now, this is significant here because Jesus is revealing himself as the Savior, the Shepherd Savior. 
My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then Jesus says of the Father who's greater than all, I and my Father are one. Now how did the Jews react to this? The Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy because you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus does not contradict them because he's just done that. He's revealed himself to be one with the Father. Not just in purpose, as the Jehovah's Witnesses say. Not just because he's a good guy and he reflects the image of God perfectly, though he's not God. But he's one, essentially. That's blasphemy, according to the Jews. He's not just an example to follow. He leads to the Father. He is God. And then... Jesus has another way to prove that, comparing these lesser beings who are like gods in the earth, the dignitaries of the earth with himself. And he says, if they can be called gods in the scripture, certainly him whom God has sanctified can be called the son of God and say that he's equal with God. Controversy. Already then, Jesus meeting the controversy by declaring unashamedly, I am God with you. I and my Father are one. And Thomas, when he says this wonderful confession in our text, John 20 and verse 28, my Lord and my God, he's saying the same thing. He's he's revealing that there's this faith being worked in him to give him to see the light and then to say what is the truth and then, of course, forever to live in response to that. But now this is my second point about the person personal confession that John's making here. A very personal confession. And it's so very important for us not to miss that uh, pronoun, a personal pronoun, my Lord, my God. Can you imagine if it were that Jesus, when he came to Thomas and told him, now reach your finger here and put your hand here, Imagine if this were only a catechism lesson and Thomas was the catechumen. He was learning at maybe my feet or your feet or somebody's feet. And he repeated an answer. Yes, you are God. Yes, you are Lord. But if he never said, you're mine, what a sham that would have been. Jesus could not have said that he was blessed then, you see. Faith would not have been worked then, you must hear. And when we preach that Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God and therefore he's Lord and Savior, we preach to the hearts if we would preach to any place here in the congregation so that hearing you might believe, and believing, you might have eternal life, and you might have all of the fruits of the blessedness of that life. You see, Thomas and his confession have ever been this cornerstone of the church's confession because it's true and because it was made by a mere man. That's the difference. You see, God could have written all the creeds and put them down in addition maybe to the Bible. Here's what this means. Creed 1, Creed 2, Belgian Confession, Jerusalem, whatever. it. But God would have the truth from the mouths of His people. And wherever there's not the truth, Not only not in the creeds, but not in the hearts. 
is the beginning of the end. Or maybe a long way down toward the end of a church. And I fear it's happened. That skepticism, that unbelief, that materialism has just taken over the place in the heart. Mine too. I speak the truth. You got a minister man here who's just a man minister. And there's these dead bones inside and this flesh and you understand that? Taking you to Romans 7. The good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, that I do. That conflict of the soul and the Apostle Paul, the champion of the divine Savior. He had it. And it affected his life personally. Thanks be to God, it, it didn't affect his confession. He said the truth. He, he wrote the truth. He was inspired by God to preach the truth. But oh, in the soul, there was trouble. There was a trouble of the flesh and, and this terrible angst that he was not serving the Lord because it was true. He was not serving the Lord perfectly as he ought and not believing Jesus is my God and my Lord. That was the problem. And Thomas had that problem for at least a week. I don't believe that Thomas was completely unconverted before this time. I'm speculating here, but I don't believe that his problem was that he was completely dead in sins. If you read of other examples of Thomas, John 11, I believe, John 14, so two other passages that I can think of. John shows himself to be a disciple, a true disciple. Jesus says, I must die. Thomas says, we'll go with him, even if we must die with him. But always, you see, Thomas had this doubt. It seems that Thomas's temperament, not like Peter's, to be brash and bold and to say things he ought not to, was to be a pessimist. We'd call him, if we know the, the books, we'd call him like an Eeyore, a, a gloomy sort of, a sort of Christian even, who always looks just at, at death and dying and the meaninglessness of it apart from the grace of God. He's what Bunyan would call the despondent one in Pilgrim's Progress, the, the one full of fear and doubts and so on. The Doubting Thomas, that's his name forever for us until we get to heaven, and then we're going to say, Thomas, thanks for your faith and God working in you, your faith. But for eight days or so, or seven days, Thomas was in a funk. Thomas was someone who went to the cross but didn't see the significance of the cross. He, he'd heard Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to rise again after three days. But he couldn't believe it. Couldn't. He was walking by his sight. When people stab you, you die, he was thinking. When people nail you to the cross, you die. When you give up the ghost, that means you're gone. You're done. And he, he witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus, but he couldn't. He couldn't believe it. And the, the, the key word is couldn't. But there's also a wouldn't. It's always the case with unbelief. Never forget that. Our unbelief, too. It's not that we can't just, but we won't just believe. I said that speaking to an atheist once. He said, I just can't believe all of that. I looked him in the eye. This was a religious conference. We were talking about world religions. And his was one. Atheism is a religion. I said, I know why you don't believe. It's not just because you can't. You won't. And you won't because you don't want to be under this God who demands something of you like your life like your heart, you won't. Atheists won't believe. They ought to, but they won't. And they can't. They're not given the grace to, but they won't. And they're responsible for that stubbornness. Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, 
and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's why the firm rebuke of Jesus, do not be an unbeliever. Be believing. Now, Thomas missed out here. I mean, a whole week of blessing. A whole week of believing. I think some of us act that way sometimes. Oh, it's just a week. I'll put believing on hold, maybe, and I'll just live like the devil. Just a night. Just a program that I'll watch. It's impossible to believe anyway. What does it get you? Here's what believing got the disciples. I speak as a man. It got the disciples. They were given this. Visits with Jesus. A visit that Thomas missed. And I I think that he was stubbornly absent from the disciples. He wasn't there on purpose. Don't know. This is speculation here. But it seems that his unbelief is the problem here. And that would have been the problem of his not assembling with the disciples. That same day, verse 19, chapter 20. The first day of the week, the doors are shut. The disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst. And then the first peace. Peace. Be with you. Peace accomplished on my cross. Peace now be with you, you disciples. And when he'd said this, he showed him his hands, he showed him his sides. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. And then he commissions them. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then he breathes on them, receive the Holy Spirit. And Thomas missed all of this. He missed it. He missed this gathering of the church, this, this first Sunday gathering, the Sunday meeting time. When they met with the Savior, he missed out on the peace and the Holy Spirit. And there he is in his funk watching television, whatever else he's doing. You can't and you won't believe. And I believe this is our problem. You can't and you won't believe. And the only solution is the Holy Spirit. And the only solution is if the Savior gives us faith. That's it. That's it. An atheist can't be a believer and won't be a believer except God turns on the lights and shows him in one way or another his side and the nail prints on his hands and his feet. Understand that? This church, when it preaches the gospel, is up against the impossible. But believing that with God all things are possible, even the turning of a heart and the working of faith in your life, my life, in our unbelieving Tendencies, their skepticism, materialism. Here's the solution. Jesus must show, and he does show to all his people, his side, his feet, and his hands. Here's the word of hope that works faith, that is written and that is preached and That is the means by which God will work faith. As John says, these are written. And you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you may have life in his name. And Jesus speaking is a reminder to us that peace is, or or that speaking is so important in the church, the speaking of that which is written, the preaching of the gospel. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is the application here. If there would be personal believing and a confession in more than a creed, but in one's heart and in one's life and in many's hearts and lives, there must be this speaking to the heart of God in Jesus Christ through the minister, through the Word of God that's brought to bear on our lives and that rebukes us and convicts us of our unbelief. And that believing is a beholding of the hands and the feet and the side of the crucified one, but that believing which is a beholding of the one who now lives. 
This is the only way that there be a people that is saved and built up. They hear the word and they believe through hearing the word of God and the grace that God works through that hearing and believing. There's something here that I want to bring to our attention. Thomas heard and we hear what Jesus will say when he comes into the midst of his assemblies. Here in this second week post-resurrection is a group that's assembled. You remember that first day of the week? There were two who went on the way to Emmaus and Jesus met with them and they didn't know Jesus. And they didn't know that he'd risen. They didn't believe it. They were going away from Jerusalem, away from the disciples. And they're going on the way, and Jesus then makes himself known to them, and he calls them, by the way, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. He rebukes them for being fools. The immediate response of those two who are going away is that they turned around and went back to the disciples and told them they'd seen the Lord. Thomas, as Jesus is now working repentance and faith in him, is brought back to the assemblies of the church. And we ourselves, as people of God in the New Testament age, in this unbelieving, skeptical, materialistic age, we need the assemblies of the church. Yes, Jesus is everywhere. But especially, He loves the house of God. I said that. Where two and three are gathered together in My name, there I am in the midst of them. Believe. Together, this word is saying here. Thomas, come back to Jesus, and Thomas, come back to the church. People of God, go back to Jesus, come back to the church. The people of God need the stated solemnities of the New Testament, the gatherings of the people of God, every Lord's Day, as often as we can. Why? We're being assaulted. We're being bombarded. We're being snared. Our young people are. Our children are. By what? By a creed without Christ and a people that says it's Christian and they've neglected the creeds, yes. But ultimately, it's by this people who've lost heart. and By ministers and elders. And even a confessing church yet that doesn't have a heart in the things of religion. Where are we? Where's this church? Where are we? Where's our heart? Where are you young people? Where are we parents? Where are we children? Meet with Jesus. Believe on Jesus. Say with Thomas. And don't call him Doubting Thomas anymore. He's Believing Thomas. He's your brother. Say, you've heard, you've seen Jesus in the preaching. My Lord, my God, say it in worship. Amen. Father in heaven, we pray that you would work faith in us and confirm us in faith. Confess your Son, our Lord, our God. May we live that way, Lord. In the light of the word he brings to us, in light of all the many trials of life, Jesus would not have us troubled. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Oh, Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Work so that we have no doubts anymore. Work so that we have convictions that show themselves in a in a cross-loving, Christ-loving life, full of peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's now worship the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we worship, let's pray for a thousand tongues, shall we? That we might sing our great Redeemer's praise. 383, 4,000 
tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. First three stanzas, 383. just want to remind the congregation and those visiting, you're more than welcome for a conversation about the wisdom of God. We want to hear God's wisdom after the fellowship uh, and the refreshments, and we want to hear that wisdom also from you. Receive God's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>